Basic Brewing Radio is sponsored in part by the American Homebrewers Association. Get ready. Saturday, August 6th is Mead Day. In celebration of this sweet homebrew holiday, the American Homebrewers Association is offering listeners $5 off membership with promo code MEADDAY22. Visit homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing to download a variety of mead recipes, find a homebrew supply shop, and dust off your mead-making skills with how-to videos. That's homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing to get $5 off for Mead Day when you join or renew by August 8th, 2022. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, June 30th, 2022. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, we're back from Homebrew Con in Pittsburgh with a ton of stuff for you to listen to. This week, we start with interviews from day one of the conference. We'll talk about mystery yeast found in an old fermenter in an abandoned tunnel, floor malting in an old elementary school, a delicious Carolina Reaper beer, and an award-winning Tej maker about going pro. And we'll talk to Julia Herz about her first uh, homebrew con as executive director of the AHA. And much more. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. And if you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs and our brewer's logbooks. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook as well. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. It's thanks to our financial supporters and our sponsors, of course, that we were able to go to HomebrewCon. We've got uh, five episodes worth of content, so it was uh, well worth the investment. And it was awesome seeing lots of listeners in person and and talking to y'all, getting pictures taken and all that fun stuff. Uh, and speaking of listeners, I want to thank everybody who went to Desiree and Dave's HighGravityBrew.com booth on the trade floor to uh, thank them for sponsoring the show. We got to spend a lot of time with Desiree and Dave along along with our buddy Zotto Connor. Uh, it was definitely a highlight of the trip. Desiree said a bunch of people mentioned the podcast to them at the High Gravity booth and thanked them for sponsoring the show. I, I had to fess up to her that, that I did ask a couple of listeners to do that <laughs> myself. But Desiree said that there were many more than just a couple. So, again, I appreciate you all doing that, and I hope that you're supporting uh, Desiree and Dave at HighGravityBrew.com as well. You know, Desiree and Dave had on display on the trade floor their Warthog electric brewing controllers that'll help you take the pain out of propane, including the EBC-130 that I have. Uh, Dave builds those himself in the back of High Gravity in Tulsa. High Gravity was putting together electric systems before electric brewing was cool. I mean, hot. <laughs> they, have, they have several turnkey configurations on HighGravityBrew.com, and they can customize one to fit your needs. And if you use the code EBC75BB, you can save $75 off your Wordhog electric brewing purchase, whether you want a whole system or, or just a controller. That's at family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com. That's HighGravityBrew.com. Show Desiree and Dave some love and some support. It was great being able to wander around at uh, Homebrew Con, interviewing random folks and, and discovering amazing beers and stories. Now, what you're about to hear is all of the interviews that we did on day one of the conference in order and pretty much unedited. And for journalists like Steve and me, the conference is a gold mine. Everybody that you talk to has a story, and every beer uh, is uh, fun to talk about and fun to taste. So we started with the first beer at the club booth in the center of the trade floor. Why don't we have a boom microphone? That's what I want to know. That costs money. Steve, <laughs> Steve we're here at the, uh, what is this, the hospitality booth? Yeah. The, uh, here, in, in, and we're at the at Homebrewcon in, in Pittsburgh. This is our first beer. It's the best one I've had all day. <laughs> <laughs> and who are we talking to? Hi, my name's Chris. I'm one of the... Uh, members of the uh, Badass uh, Beer Club, brewers and drinkers around Silver Spring. In Silver Springs, Maryland? Maryland, yeah, right outside D.C. Awesome. 
And what are we drinking here? Uh, so this is a uh, mild ESB, something along those lines. I uh, brewed up about a month ago. Mm. What do you think, Steve? It's very tasty, and I understand you grew the hops for this. Yeah, I got uh, some hop, uh, one things, some hop vines or whatever. A couple years ago, from a friend, they've been going in the backyard just as they go. So uh, I got, uh, they started producing about two years ago. So I froze them from last year and the year before, and threw them in this beer and see. I'm just going to see how it worked. It's delicious. Uh, so what, what's the environment in Maryland for growing hops? It's, it's a little too hot in Arkansas, where we're from. Oh, yes. Uh, we are probably right on the border of, like, acceptable hop growing, uh, where I wouldn't recommend a uh, huge large scale. But we do have a couple breweries that do grow hops. They do throw it in there. But it's like a seasonal one-off beer situation. They're not really large operations. Now tell me about this beer. What's what's the grain bill? And, and you fermented with this. This is not an English yeast. Oh no, not at all. Um, I wanted to get this done quick, so I threw in one of the Omega Quick yeasts. Um, I cannot tell you what uh, variety it was, uh, but they're here today somewhere. They might be able to. Uh, they're actually right behind us. Uh, they might be able to uh, taste it and tell you. But I uh, did that, and then I uh, did a three-gallon batch with uh, five pounds of two row. Just basic pale two row, and then uh, a pound of caramel malt. It's a little heavy on that, but it worked out pretty well. I don't think it's heavy. Yeah. Yeah. It's not heavy for the style. Yeah, yeah, it's it's nice and it, it's not. You say heavy, but it, it's not. It's nice and dry. It's nice and crisp. Uh, it's got a little bit of of um, citrusy fruitiness. Do you think that's the hops or the yeast? Um, I actually liked probably the yeast. I used uh, I have glacier hops, which are apparently like very mild, just a kind of basic bittering hop. Um, I don't really know what they taste like in a beer quite yet from my own plants. So because um, I need a lot more than uh, I think I had three ounces that I had. So what I kept reading online was uh, you got to have like double the amount of volume compared to a pellet hop to get the same effect from a full hop. Um, and I had about the same. So. <laughs> Um, you know, it was, uh, you're not getting a ton of hop flavor, but it works for the style. It, it just gets it bitter enough. It works well with everything, apparently. I'm glad it worked. So, Good job. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. I think we have a couple other things here, too, is that we're getting set up. They, they'll be ready by the time we're done talking, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> we're really hoping. All right. Looks like they're figuring it out. So, Well, th- well thanks, for, uh, thanks for the beer, and, and congratulations. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have fun. Okay, it's our second beer of the day. I'm going to have to stop saying that because, you know, then people will know how many beers we had. Well, I, I can't do that much math. <laughs> yeah, it gets harder as we go it gets along. Harder as we go. So, uh, so Joe's getting a, uh, a sample of his beer. Who, who, uh, now, tell me who you are and where you're from. Sure, my name is Joe Rafferty um, with the Malt Homebrew Club from Asheville, North Carolina. Oh, okay. Wow. So, so, so we're from Arkansas, so, so okay. sort of say. And it, it, Steve said, don't mention. <laughs> The baseball game. We're, we're oh, baseball. yeah. Okay. That was a, what was it, 9 to 1? I don't it was, remember. It was a it whooping. Was like, yeah. Well, we got spanked the day after or something. So. Yeah. But on, on to happier things, what, what kind of beer do we have here? Uh, this is a Munich Kellis. Uh, made that probably three or four months ago. It's been just kind of loggering away, waiting on the event here. So, um, obviously, majority pills malt. Got a little bit of uh, Munich. Slight touch of melanoidin. Um, I did not do a decoction or anything, so I just added a small percentage of that. And then just uh, WLP 830, so German lager yeast, and uh, extra love and care and attention and time, and uh, here we are. Here we are. So you're a brewer in the south, like yep. like us. Uh, did you have some uh, some mechanical help with your lagering? Or? Yeah, I've got a, a big stainless conical that I put in an upright freezer with a temperature controller on it, so it's kind of cheating as far as home goes. <laughs> I, I was going to accuse you of that, but I... <laughs> no swamp coolers, no T-shirts, no. and a bucket of water and all that stuff. No, I don't. I thankfully don't have to get too creative. I just pump it right in there from the system and, and let it rock. Well, it's a super clean beer. It's very, very nice. A great example of the style. It, it um, yeah. It's, Everything everything's balanced and tastes terrific. So, what's your what are your secrets to to a nice, clean, fermented lager? Um, I take a lot of measure for yeast health. You know, I'm big on pitching appropriate rates. I'm big on very strict temperature control. 
Uh, I don't really do any findings or anything. Um, I just let time do its thing, and uh, it seems to, uh, seems to work pretty well. But I, I really focus on good ingredients, healthy pitches, tight temperature control. Thankfully, live in White Lab, one of their backyards, so we get good fresh samples from them. So shout out to White Labs. They're really good to our club here. We, we have um, every other month we get to meet in one of their spaces. So um, they, they've always been great to us, as well as Sierra Nevada. Even they've got a room that we get to use. So um, shout out to both of them. A big help for our club, for sure. Yeah, it turns out North Carolina is a good beer state. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. We we're lucky. I moved to Asheville um, right at 14 years ago and have seen a, a, a really nice boom. I thought it was, you know, one of the beer city USAs when I moved there. And, you know, we've probably multiplied fivefold since then. So it's been been fun. Yeah. You did a great job. I appreciate it. Y'all come back. Plenty more. <laughs> Thanks. So tell me who you are and where you're from. Uh, Brendan Carroll with the CNC Malton Company. We're here in Pittsburgh now at the Homebrew Convention, and uh, we're located about an hour north of here between the towns of Butler and Catanning, so kind of west-central PA. Uh, now we're off the highway there is 420, excuse me, half mile off the highway there is uh, 422. Uh, we were talking earlier about the uh, barley harvest. It's coming off now here in Pennsylvania, so exciting times. Uh, we've got about 54 acres off already, about another uh, 100 or so, 150 to go. And uh, so far it's looking good, about 70 bushel to 80 bushel an acre. Um, nice barley, dried down nice for us, so a real good year harvest-wise in Pennsylvania. So we're happy for that. Um, hopefully we can make up for some of the shortcomings in the rest of the world. Um, but Yeah, we were talking a little about our malt house, um, so I guess we could jump back into that. It's an old elementary school, about 30,000 square foot. Everything we do is floor malt it, and so we go with a uh, turner that we built, a beautiful little stainless uh, rototiller kind of machine, and that turns it about three, four times a day. We drag it through the malt. That keeps it aerated, keeps it cool, and keeps it from clumping up. Um, sometimes clumping's okay, like in the Munich malt. If you want to try that Munich, we allow that to clump at the end. But other than that, we keep it turned, uh, keep it aerated. Then we kiln it out and uh, make a lot of very nice traditional uh, floor malts. We've been told that we're more Maris Otter than Maris Otter. Which, oh, really? Really? Uh, yeah. And uh, so Maris Otter is actually a variety, and a lot of people kind of use that as a misnomer for pale ale type malt is what comes to mind. Uh, we work with some varieties that are in the Maris Otter family. Um, most of the malts we work with, uh, the barleys, excuse me, that we work with are of European descent. So from Lima grains, we do uh, Calypso, Violetta. Uh, we work with uh, TP. So um, it, it works out very well for us being a, kind of a more humid climate. We don't run into pre-sprout issues, and they're a little more... Um, What's the word? Resistant to uh, vomitoxin and dawn, so we don't have issues with the uh, fusariums, the fungus that causes those. So we don't have issues with those. We, we spray to keep that in a, a manageable level, but we're growing some great barley here and making some great malt. Steve, you had a little issue with vomitoxin last HomebrewCon, I think. Uh, well, that was later in the week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Just a joke. But I... You said you had so many acres coming off. Do you grow your own bar? Do you have your own farms? No, so we contract with our neighbors. Um, farms are typically, most of our acreage is about two miles from the malt house. Um, we do stretch out maybe to about 30 miles or so. And uh, so pretty much we work with the farmers to grow, what varieties to grow, what to spray with. Um, so it's a partnership. Um, turning the malt four or five times a day takes up most of my day, so it's a... Uh, it's uh, it'd be hard to get out and spray as well. So, so does uh, does your size allow you to be kind of nimble in in trying new, different malt uh, techniques and different styles that other people, uh, larger companies, may not? Uh, yes, sir. I guess the audience can't see me nodding my head, but yes. <laughs> so we have uh, we started off just doing two hundred pounds in a batch. So figure worst case you mix that up we feed it to the chickens so we keep chickens for just that reason but uh so there's a lot of times we'll have requests for the, the next thing we're doing is an under modified pilsner so that's not something everyone wants we'll do a, a small run of that see if it's uh makes the brewer happy if he's happy then we'll do a large production run so in our production run 
is roughly four tons per batch. So even that's not a huge amount. If uh, the uh, kind of whims of the industry change, we could uh, change with it. Do you do any smoking? We do. So on the table, the first one up is a uh, pear-smoked wheat malt, and we did that very heavily smoked. So our smokers really this neat thing. I wish we could show you the video, show your audience the video. It looked like a witch's brew. So it's a big old industrial popcorn maker. We put a wedge wire false bottom in and put our firebox about 10 feet away so we get more of a cool smoke to the uh, malt. And this one, we built up a bigger fire, got some heat to it, gave some local caramelization so you get some sweetness in there with the smoky. Um, we just got back from Scotland a week ago today, and excuse me, we brought some peat back with us, so we'll be doing some peat smoked as well. Uh, for the most part, we're smoking over fruit wood, so apple's my favorite. Um, people uh, ask for oak, we do oak, we do peach, we're going to do cherry next. Uh, as I mentioned, that's pear. Apple's really nice. We uh, like to think that our apple tree was pined up by Johnny Appleseed. We're in the right neighborhood. It's an old tree. I can't uh, confirm or deny that, but it's a good story. <laughs> well, what so. I've got to know is, what was it like getting Pete back through customs? <laughs> it was surprisingly easy. My wife thought the same thing. She said, you're not going to get through with that. And I looked it up, and soil is absolutely positively not allowed. That's what Pete is. But the first thing on the exemption list, just peat. And if you think about it, they're cutting it, then they're dry, killing, drying in it, high temperatures, so that kills everything. Yeah, so yeah. we're not uh, cross-infecting our continents here. Um, so basically, it was about 20 kilograms, so we stuck a baggage label on it and hoped that it stayed. It fell off when we got it in Washington. Uh, but then we went, and the lady was nice enough to print me another uh, baggage label, so we uh, stuck it on and um, got it back through. So... Um, yeah, it, it's pretty easy. If you're traveling to Scotland, uh, leave yourself uh, one bag uh, for the return. You can take some peat back with you and smoke yourself. I was just imagining the conversation. Do you have anything to declare, sir? Well, yes, I've got some peat. Uh, <laughs> so, so how do homebrewers out there listening uh, find you? Uh, on our website, uh, cncmalt.com, or if they're in the neighborhood, they could stop out the malt house and pay us a visit. We're out uh, 719 Clearfield Road, Fennelton, PA, or the best method's uh, the telephone, so 570-954-4500. Give us a shout, and we'll get you set up. Thanks, Brendan. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Enjoy your beer. Thanks. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. You probably already know that Ricky and Kelly from our friends and sponsors Gronfell and Havoc Meaderies in Vermont post homebrew scale recipes of some of their delicious craft meads and a vlog or blog, not a vlog. Well, they did they did have a blog, a vlog there for a while with valuable mead making info. Well, uh, Ricky the mead maker has been posting his weekly brew journal on Gronfell.com recently that gives you a day to day look behind the scenes of a commercial meadery. For example. Uh, taking a look at this past week's journal, 6-2022, reprogrammed the keg cleaner, and it's working fantastically. Blew a line and overfilled the sani tank, but those are minor hiccups, plus the floor near the loading dock hasn't been this clean, let alone sanitized, in years. Six twenty one twenty two. braggy is done. I love this batch so much. Jake was totally right that one more pound of elderflower would make all the difference. And 622-22, just packing boxes and prepping for Ren Fair. So <laughs> that's life, life uh, a day in the life of a meadery. So uh, if you want to find that, uh, you know, it's great if you're, if you're starting a, a brewery or thinking of a starting a, a brewery or a meadery, uh, you can search for Ricky's Brew Journal on Groenfeld.com to get a peek behind the scenes of uh, day-to-day life uh, in that profession. And while you're on Gronfeld.com, check out the wide range of delicious craft meads and honey beverages that they're shipping right now across the country. Always something new and tasty. And our friends and sponsors, Ricky and Kelly from Gronfeld and Havoc Meaderies, check it all out at family-owned and operated Gronfeld.com. That's G R O E N N. F E L L. All right, tell me who you are and where you're from. Uh, I'm Mike Jewell from Silver Spring, Maryland. And what's your club? Uh, badass. <laughs> and joining joining us is Zotto Connor. Howdy. 
regular of the podcast. Now, uh, I'm sipping on a beer that uh, I was scared of the title, and when I got my first sample, it was just a little squirt because I didn't want to burn my uh, burn my uh, taste buds off. What do we got here? So this is a uh, uh, Viking Pilsner malt uh, with sucrose, and then I have all the different uh, pumpkin pie spices added to it. And for a 15-gallon batch, I added in primary uh, six cut-in-half Carolina Reaper peppers. <laughs> Now, for those of you not familiar with the Carolina Reaper, it's either the ugliest pepper or a beautiful pepper, depending on on uh, what you what you think. It's a it's kind of a, a red, scary, wrinkly looking pepper, right? Yeah, and it's got like a scorpion stinger tail on the tip of it. And what are what's the Scoville level? Do you remember? So it's a it's a range, but they can go up to two million. I, I, a friend of mine grew these uh, at one point, and I, I've said on the show before, but I've, I tasted a piece of the de-seeded flesh that was about half the size of my, my pinky nail, and uh, it tasted delicious at first, and then the top of my head started sweating, and it, you know, worked its way down my face, and, you know, my autonomic, my heart started beating faster, you know, so it is something to deal with, but this, this beer... I was afraid that it was going to blow my head off, but it's actually got a really nice flavor. But and the heat is there, but it's it's a lot more reserved than I thought it would be. Yeah, it's about as as hot as as is still enjoyable. <laughs> what do you think, Zod? Uh, I agree. the 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 foam was very dangerous. Uh, Steve did not take well to the foam earlier, but the finish it's not in the mouth; it's only in the finish, which is kind of amazing. Uh, do you attribute that to the spices or the the, the I mean, it sounds like a very thin beer to begin with. It, it is, and I use Hornendal Quike is the is the the yeast I use. So I mean, it was, and it was super under pitched and not terribly warm when I pitched it. Um, so it, it's pretty clean. Um, but yeah, and I just used a little bit. Like I've made habanero beers. I made a Bucciolokia beer one time. I've done a bunch of jalapeno beers. So I'm good at kind of where to add the peppers and how many. So I kind of, you know, six of these cut in half in primary for probably uh, three or four weeks was was what I decided on. So, seeds in? Yeah, seeds in. Even the stems, the stems were still attached. Wow. So, you know, uh, James has been on the tincture track for a while. <laughs> Um, which, you know, you know, about two years behind me on that one. Um, and I think that's the right way to go when you're trying to figure out how to balance it. How, how did you figure out how to balance how many peppers to put in? Because that's a risk. So, I mean, if they were all hot, you just ruined 15 gallons of beer. Well, I, I have a pretty high heat tolerance. So I was willing to drink all of it no matter how it turned out. I had a I had a, a, an oyster uh, dunkel vice that didn't go too well. Um, and I drink, actually, I'm still working on that. It's been about a year and a half. I'm trying to slowly, you know, but I was, I was, what, however it turned out, I was going to drink it. I, I can eat a whole Carolina Reaper. At one time on Instagram, I ate two, which I'll never do ever again. But I mean, I can, I can have a high tolerance. So I, I knew it was not going to be ruined for me. And I had made Bucciolokia beer. So I kind of treated the Carolina Reaper the same way I treated the Bucciolokia and it worked out pretty well. I'm not going to ask you how your day was after that experience, or, or the day after. Yeah, it was a, it was about a rough 18 hours. <laughs> I won't ask you why, but uh, so the, you also talked about pumpkin spice in this beer, right? Yeah. So uh, for those who always, you know, have wonderful things to say about pumpkin spice, I didn't, when I first tasted the beer, I only tasted a small sample. I didn't notice the pumpkin spice so much. It, it kind of blends in with the rest of it, uh, and it actually is not a pumpkin spice forward beer, would you say? I mean, I think it seems to me that you mastered the balance of that pretty well. Well, thank, thank you. I mean, it's um, usually when I make a pumpkin ale, I put the same amount of pumpkin spice in as I do when I make a, a pumpkin ale. And then I just added the Reapers on top of it, which kind of just take all the focus away from the pumpkin spice. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know there was any pumpkin spice in it, but it definitely has a mouthfeel much more than just, you said you put Victory Malt in? Uh, no, it's a Viking Pilsner. It's all Pilsner. 
uh, with sucrose, right? With sucrose. I'm not a fan of Pilsner malt as a base beer typically, and I would have said, oh, that's going to be thin if you told me. And I think the spice is what kept that. Like, I did not detect anything wrong with the, the mouthfeel. Um, and it didn't taste like a pepper beer going in or chili beer going in. It definitely, you know, the, your throat has this nice, wonderful burn to it. James, yep. <laughs> yeah, actually, this sample, it is starting to build up, but yeah. not any. Incre- if I, I think if I drank a whole pint of it, I would be feeling it by the end. And now I am getting more cinnamon. It's mostly cinnamon to me. Yeah. Maybe a little bit of clove. But again, it's not overpowering. It's not something like people would make fun of. Well, cool. That's that's good to hear. I, I I was worried, you know, with this this crowd. Like I I made it more for like my friends that are maybe not so much in the brewing community. Like if I brought it to one of our meetings, I would kind of think people would be like, "Oh no, this is too much." Um, but yeah, it's good to hear. I'm glad it's not it's not novelty crazy. Yeah. 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 yeah that's the thing about this conference is that. You do get to try a lot of things that, oh, that was fun for an ounce, <laughs> but I don't know if I'd drink a whole pint. I would drink a pint of this. I might regret it the next day, but sure. Cool. I That's good to hear. <laughs> I think you underestimated your audience. You should put a big bumper sticker up there with exclamation points and say Carolina Reaper, and we'd go in an hour here. <laughs> yeah. This is this is the conference for people who go like, Carolina Reaper beer? I want that right now. <laughs> okay, now, now, now introduce your introduce your girlfriend. Uh, this is my girlfriend, Katie Egan. She inspired the beer. <laughs> the, the person, the, there's the face that launched a thousand ships, and there's there's the person that launched a, a spicy beer. I, I would say the person who burned your esophagus. <laughs> <laughs> To, to be honest, uh, we had made holiday cookies, and I was saying that uh, I wanted a spicy gingerbread cookie, and then we started talking about beer, because we talk about beer a lot. And so Mike grows peppers all the time, and he was like, what if we made a Reaper gingerbread cookie beer? And this is what came out of that. So, it was, so what do you think? I love it, but don't drink too much of it, because you'll wake up on the bathroom floor, and you won't know how you got there. <laughs> So, Tuesday. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Just a Tuesday. (laughs) We have to remind ourselves to pour it in small glasses. Otherwise, we'll, like, pour a whole pint of it and then be like, how did we get here? (laughs) So, it's like that episode of The Simpsons where where Homer coats his throat with wax and... and drinks or eats that pepper and has the hallucinogenic experience exactly it's not quite that good but it is really good and my favorite thing about this beer actually is that some spicy beers are really like hit your lips and your lips start tingling this has none of that it like even if you don't really love spicy things this could be a beer that you'd be willing to try because it's all in that i think you mentioned it's at the after it's in the swallow right (laughs) you get the real spicy kick in the heat of it so, I, I mean, that makes it drinkable for me. So I'm glad you enjoyed drinking it, too. Yeah. I might get another one. <laughs> Actually, it does bring up, first off, that's exactly right. It does not hurt my lips, and I have chapped lips all the time. What was the uh, ABV of it? I don't think you said so. It's a little over nine. What? <laughs> yeah, it's, what? It's, it's imperial. God. I figured out why you're waking up on the bathroom floor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that explains a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I would not have guessed that. Wow. Uh, again, excellent job. Oh, thank you very much. And you do. Thank you. Have a great day. <laughs> Tell me who you are and where you're from. Uh, my name is Rob Westendorf. I'm with the Bloterian Brewing League from Cincinnati, Ohio. Oh, okay. Wow. How far is Cincinnati away from here? It was about a four and a half hour drive, so it's 240 miles or so. Not as far as I thought. My, my geography is not so great. <laughs> So what are we about to sample here? Okay, so this beer is a Baltic porter made with an experimental yeast. The yeast is called Missing Link. It is. It was found in fermenters that had been hidden behind a brick wall of a brewery that closed in Cincinnati more than 100 years ago. It was the Link Brewery, hence the Missing Link on the yeast. So a, um, a, a brewery owner in Cincinnati... Uh, for the Urban Artifact Brewery, who's a uh, bio- bio- biochemist and yeast specialist by trade, took about 100 samples out of the, the room. One of them was positive for yeast, grew it up with the help of Omega, and they're starting to 
characterize this and hopefully eventually commercialize this yeast. So we really don't know what it is because it ferments slow as an ale. It ferments fast as a lager. Uh, it doesn't dry as an ale. It goes dry as a lager. Uh, a few well, last month we had a competition in Cincinnati for people just using this yeast, where everybody was encouraged just try it. We're just trying to learn what it does. So I think there were nine commercial beers and twenty-seven home brews, uh, of various types ranging from Baltic Porter to Wit to Classic American Pilsners to uh, I think there was a Schwartz beer. You know, all. Just trying to find out what it does. <laughs> well, that's fun. Uh, this is a delicious beer, but you didn't make it. My wife made that beer. And your wife's name is? Roxanne Westendorf, who is also on the governing committee of the AHA. Oh, okay. So credit where credit is due. Yes. And besides that, we've got a wit here that she also made with the same yeast. And tomorrow at club night, we'll have a couple other beers made with that yeast. What do you think, Steve? Uh, it's a good beer, and I'm curious if there was any conclusions from all the test brews. I don't think everything has been concluded yet. I, the day of the competition, I wasn't able to be there, um, so I didn't participate in it. Uh, I know they've collected everything and they're crunching the numbers, but I don't know. I don't know where it stands yet. The competition really wasn't that long ago. So, any idea of the, the like the alcohol tolerance or you know some of the the characteristics? It, uh, I think. Well, nobody has had it stall out on high alcohol, but I don't know if anybody's tried anything above about nine percent yet. But so, I think, you know, up to nine percent, it seems to be fine. So, what are the, I mean? What are the chances that this is just? you know, some wild yeast that just happened to be in the brewery? Or, or is it, or, you know, are people pretty confident that this was a commercially used beer yeast? We're not confident at all. <laughs> uh, I mean, literally, you know, it's the fermenter was sealed up. for Nobody looked at it for 100 years. Uh, so, you know, they took samples from inside the fermenters all over the room. One came positive. It could be anything. Uh, the story's great. We don't know if it was the brewery's yeast or not, uh, but it's making good beer. So this is Geraldo Rivera's Al Capone's vault with something actually in it. That's right. <laughs> and and uh, it just it's amazing how you can, you know, go scrape some yeast off of an old fermenter or a piece of wild fruit or whatever, and it's like, holy crap, it's good stuff. And it, and it seems like it... it it uh, it got to work right away. I mean, it it, it seems like it's a, it's adapted to fermenting. Yeah, it, it definitely and it's it's unusual in fermenting because it, it can be very clean, fresh, but it ages more like a Belgian. So like in our competition, we had separate flights for fresh and aged beers, where aged had to be a, a year or more old. Uh, and so the aged winner, which was also my wife, uh, was an 18-month-old Orval clone. And I would say the way it aged, it, it kind of developed over 18 months about the same character Orval does in about three or four months. So it, it's slower than a standard Brett, but it's got some of that same character. Yeah, this is a, very, a fairly clean fermented beer. There's, uh, there's no, certainly no bread character that I can pick up. That, I think that's about six weeks old. Well, that's interesting. Does temperature seem to have a difference? Or you said it fermented uh, different as ales and, and lager. Yeah, uh, she fermented that, I believe, at 60. Um, and, you know, it, you can see it comes out fairly clean. Most of the people who fermented up in the upper 60s found they had to co-pitch something else to get it to, to finish out. Huh. That's interesting. That's counterintuitive. Wait a good one. <laughs> Steve is shrugging. <laughs> well, this is delicious, and, and congratulations to, to your wife. And it's and this is um, it's a fun experiment. It'd be fun. It, it it'd be fun to see you know some results down the line. Uh, you know, I'll I'll sort of interpret it. I believe that they're going to have the missing link competition again next year, uh, and try to expand the. 
the, the, the range of what everybody's going to do, and hopefully it goes beyond just Cincinnati. It's kind of up to Omega at this point as to whether they determine whether they're going to really commercialize it or not. But for the competition, at least, they gave away the yeast. We're literally throwing yeast packets at, you know, you get a yeast and you get a yeast. And, you know, go out. And, it's nope. the Oprah strain. Yes, exactly. You know, <laughs> go forth and ferment. I'm curious about the, the brewery itself. So it was Cincinnati, it sounds like it could have been a German, American, German-style brewery. So... Most people nowadays think of German beers in America as being Milwaukee or St. Louis. Before Prohibition, Cincinnati's beers, Cincinnati had more than twice as many beer breweries as those two places combined. Wow. You know, at one point, there were 79 breweries inside of a four square mile downtown Cincinnati. Um, wow. And they weren't sending any of it out of town because Cincinnati is so German, they were consuming it all. This is fascinating and delicious. Thanks. <laughs> All right, tell, tell me who you are and where you're from. Uh, Brett Coleman Baker from Urban Artifact in Cincinnati, Ohio. And we, we just uh, uh, recently uh, uh, talked to Rob over here about the, the Missing Link uh, yeast. So tell us about how your involvement in, in this uh, project. So um, I'm the owner and brewer head brewer or whatever you want to call it over at Urban Artifacts and there is a beer historian in Cincinnati named Michael Morgan who teaches a class at the University of Cincinnati about beer history or beer 101 basically. So he's been coming to breweries once a quarter. He brings his classes by and he goes to four breweries a quarter and he asked us if he could come to our brewery as the fourth brewery because we only make sour beer. So the first three breweries were like, here's how it's done traditionally. Here's the brewery that throws all the rules out the window. So I got to know him pretty well. And over time, uh, he found a loggering tunnel underneath Cincinnati in the OTR district. And he comes to me and he goes, hey, I know this is going to sound crazy, but in a loggering tunnel that's been sealed up for 100 years, I found a wood fermenter that's still intact. And I know that you found some wild yeast before and you've isolated some stuff. Can you come and try to see if you can find a yeast? I said, I don't think we're going to find <laughs> but I think that sounds like a lot of fun. So let's see what happens. And, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's the short of it. So how, how many samples did you take? We took 100 samples. Uh, <laughs> 90 were total just <laughs> uh, 10 were, like, fermented a little bit of varying degrees of flavor and goodness. Um, so we sent those 10 away to Omega Yeast Labs to get isolated and plated out and, and look for yeast. Uh, they found... Four yeasts. One was Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So out of 100 samples, one was a brewing yeast. Wow. Literally a 1% success rate. So how confident, I asked, I asked Rob, how, how, how confident are you that that was a yeast that was actually used for brewing? Or, you know, is it just accidental that this is, was a wild yeast that was found in place? There's definitely a chance it's a wild yeast that just found its way into things. I think the, the fun thing is like, oh, this is a pre-pro yeast that was actually used by this brewery and it was in the thing and blah, blah, blah. The chances of that are really low. What we actually think the case probably is, is that during Prohibition, when these tunnels were supposed to be sealed up and not being used, what we're guessing is, is that there is a, you know, an alcohol runner under there making illegal booze probably using a bread yeast because it doesn't attenuate very well and it doesn't have a lot of traditional beer flavors to it. So we're thinking it's probably a bread yeast that was used to make illicit alcohol during Prohibition. That would be my odds on money. Could be a wild yeast. Could actually be a legitimate German yeast brought over, you know, pre-pro, but it's hard to say. It, we sequenced the genome and it doesn't match anything that currently exists. Yeah, that was my next question. <laughs> Could you take the DNA signature? We did, yep. So, uh, I mean, it's it's a fun story, number one, it is. which is excellent for marketing, uh, yes. But yes. <laughs> which is important. Uh, yeah, but but apparently, you know, people are brewing with it and finding finding it doing all kinds of different things and all kinds of different beers. So, you yes. know, that's exciting as well. The well, okay. So we we got this yeast. We gave it to the city. The city officially made June fourth Missing Link Day as part of like an official decree and what we've really been proud and happy of is is the home brewers that have 
taken it and owned it and done all these things and are figuring out how it works and what tastes well and what doesn't. And, you know, I make one batch a year. I don't get to have that much fun with it. And i got to make sure it sells. The, you know, if you're home brewing, you can make 10, 20, 30 batches if you split it out and have fun with it. And that's and that's what the, the bloatarians in Cincinnati did. And, you know, they we had... 40 entries in our homebrew club this year it was i mean it was awesome it was, it was it's really cool to see the beers people are making with this that i don't get the chance to do because i financially can't take the risk well, tell us about your brewery uh we are a um fruit sour beer only brewery in cincinnati ohio uh we have a very defined niche and we're doing really well with it and i i just love fruit it's that, that that's it <laughs> And your name is Brett. So. Yes. <laughs> you know, funnily enough, we started off doing a, the breadth of sour beer when we started. Like, we did, you know, Brett beers. We did wild beers. We did spontaneous beers. We did fruited sours. Um, and over time, we realized people don't really buy Brett beers that much. And we, we don't make them anymore. So my own namesake is, is, gar- is garbage. You're too horsey. <laughs> <laughs> I smell like <laughs> <laughs> Well, excellent. Thanks for sharing the story. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate your time. We got to record an episode with Dr. uh, Matt Winans, head of R&D at our friends and sponsors, Imperial Organic Yeast. We talked to Dr. Matt about making sake at home because he he did a, a session on that and about the new hybrid yeast strain from Imperial uh, I-22 Capri. Uh, Matt walked us through the uh, process of getting juice, which is an English yeast strain, and Loki, a Kvike strain, to reproduce together to form a brand new strain. It's a complicated process, and he went through all the uh, details. Uh, That's coming up in a future episode. I brewed a no-boil extract beer with I-22 Capri and Zamba hops. Steve also made a mead. Uh, And I had Susan taste the hydrometer sample of my Capri beer, and she said, pineapple. Now, I tasted tropical fruit, too, and a very teeny tiny bit of banana. uh, After kegging, uh, I decided to uh, dry hop in the keg to bring up the hop character a bit more uh, with some random hop remains that I had in the freezer. And uh, I don't know how it's tasting yet because uh, the hop bag immediately sank to the bottom and clogged the dip tube. (laughs) So I've I've got some surgery to do there. (laughs) So that story is still evolving. Uh, You know we love Imperial Organic Yeast. My stir plate is dusty because I don't use it anymore to make moderate gravity five-gallon batches. And my airlocks are usually bubbling before bedtime. Ask your local homebrew store about Imperial I-22 Capri, the new hybrid yeast strain from Imperial. And find out more at imperialyeast.com. That's Imperial Yeast. Dot com. Tell me who you are and where you're from. Hello, my name is LaVon Barker. I live in Miami Beach, but I also have a place in Chicago, Illinois. And you were starting a story and uh, to telling Steve and me the story, and I said, no, wait a minute, we got to capture this because <laughs> this is good stuff. So start all over again, your story with Tej. Yes, I make a... Ethiopian Tej home brew. I started producing it, I started making it in 2016. And the reason is inside Ethiopia there's a high mortality rate. A lot of kids don't make it to one years old. So when a kid does make it to one years old, they have a birthday celebration. It is a very large celebration. A lot of members of the community attend. And when our son was going to turn one years old, um, I looked in the community. There were two women primarily who made it and my profession is as a Six Sigma Master Black Belt. So I figure most things are a process. And so I figured I'll try to make this. I'm a good cook, so I know my way around ingredients, kitchen, things like that. So I went down the path of finding recipes online to actually make this and talking to people in the community, in the Ethiopian community, about ingredients, how to source it, and things like that. So I made it for the one year, for his one year birthday. And elders in the community liked it, uh, family members liked it, and they actually asked me to start making it for their Easter um, Orthodox. And so I had some left over, I gave it to some people, they liked it. I went to the Wisconsin State Fair that year, 2016, and I saw they had a beer and wine competition, 
And I started saying, well, a lot of people in the community like, you know, like it. What would professional judges like? And Ethiopian Tej is made from water, honey, and gesho. Gesho is a bush that's only grown in Ethiopia. And so that's what separates it from just a pure mead. And traditionally, well, most people now just make it with the wood. Um, but a long time ago, they used to make it with the leaves also. So I made a batch with the leaves, a batch with the wood, and a combination batch. And I entered those three into the 2017 Wisconsin State Fair. And I won first, second, third, and best of show. <laughs> wow. Well, there you go. <laughs> that's proof of concept right there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, that's, that's proof of concept. <laughs> and, and so from there, various people um, asked me to make it for them. And, of course, you can't sell it. So I, you know, I didn't sell it. But um, most recently, last year, even a, um, a charity golf tournament um, leadership asked me to to make some to actually give in the um, gift bags for um, for various members. Um, a few Ethiopian restaurants have asked me to make it for them, and that what started me on the path of actually um, getting the federal licenses, permits, and I'm actually going through the process now of getting the state permit so we can actually sell it to them. Wow. So you're on the verge of going pro. Yes, <laughs> yes. And actually, um, at, at, at this conference, I actually just attended on one of the uh, one of the sessions I was talking about. So you want to take it from being a homebrew to a pro. So it was actually a very I'm glad I came to the conference. Um, the presenter was very good. Um, I even asked a question about going from homebrew to more of a winery or brewery and as far as the ingredients, the taste difference and things like that. So I'm very happy about this conference. I'm very glad that I came to it. So how do you source your ingredients? Oh, that's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will say, I will give a, uh, a plug to um, Brunda. There's a, a company inside Oakland, California, that you can actually go online. and I mean, they have a store in Oakland, but you can actually go um, online and order from them and Amazon. So they're actually um, a place I use in, in the beginning, but my current source is a um, secret. <laughs> So I think I, I I think that we've done a sh- pardon me you know this is maybe the 801st episode of the of the podcast so my my, my memory is is a little foggy uh, but I've done it it seems like I've I've talked about Tej on the on the show before but it's been a long time describe the character of of the drink okay so since the drink is made with just water honey and Kesha, which is this bush, you know, you using the wood and leaves from it. So it is going to have a slight earthy taste. The type of honey that you use, well, the type of honey that I use is orange blossom, which is more of a candied honey to cut through and reduce some of the earthiness taste of it and give it more of that sweet, enjoyable taste versus just more of a traditional um, earthy, musty um, kind of taste that some people say they don't like. And in all actuality, uh, when I first tasted Tej, that earthy, musty taste, um, hints of vanilla. <laughs> oh, <okay>. uh, <laughs> hints yeah. of vanilla. Uh, when I tasted that, I actually said there's something nice underneath this, and I wanted to figure out how to actually get past that earthiness. And so um, my filtering process is different than the traditional process, and my use of orange blossom honey to actually make it more sweet, more candied, um, gives it a refreshing, um, sweet, enjoyable, um, pleasurable um, taste. So, so how are the ingredients added, and do you use heat in the process at all? You do not have to use heat in the process. There are some people who would heat up the honey only to, you know, so it's more meldable in, inside the um, inside the must. But I don't use any heat any heating process. Um, it is more so of the water, honey first, just mixing it up and then taking a gravity reading so I know the maximum alcohol percent that can come out of it. But then um, after a few days adding the guest show, I actually use a open fermentation process the um, first few days, and then after the third day go to closed. Um, huh. For a couple of years during the pandemic, I actually, oh, I'll tell you, I went to my where I get my wine supplies, um, this is 2020, and I was asking them because I, I was looking on YouTube and I saw that people actually closed it, um, closed the lid in the beginning, and I asked the people at the winery about it, and they was like, 
Yeah, you know, actually, if they closed it in the beginning, they was like, yes. And I was like, I've never closed it in the beginning. I said, I've always left it open those first three days. And that was my introduction to, that's open fermentation. <laughs> <laughs> which which I interestingly found out that a lot of people don't like doing it that way because they like to control the air, the bacteria, different things that, that can actually get into it. So for two years, I tried out the, you know, closing it from the beginning and I notice it loses some of the character um, to the point now that from now on I only do um, open fermentation. So, so you think that it's? I mean, I assume that you use commercial yeast for the for the pr- <clears throat> primary fermenting. Um, but so, do you think that there are some you know microflora in your environment that are coming in and contributing to the character? Yes, and that's a, an interesting point. As far as commercial yeast, I only use maybe. Um, your pinky fingernail size of a commercial yeast. It's actually the bacteria from the wood and leaves that actually makes the uh, the yeast that will ferment it. So the wood and the wood and leaves makes the yeast that will convert it, and it also imparts flavor to it. So it is as minimal as possible of a commercial yeast that you that you add into it. Huh. Now, you know my. Uh, my instinct is to think that you know if you if you used a process something like that you would get something that's kind of funky or you know wild tasting uh, but it doesn't sound like that that's the primary character no it's it's not a funky or wild taste you really get the the gesho wood you know the wood flavor and so therefore that's also important to tannins and stuff for your mouth feel but I've been able to get consistent tasting batches from this process so um, maybe it's uh, now. I don't sit it outside, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. That would be probably too much bacteria. So I would say. Um, so I brew it at, at my home. I, I have a designated area for it, and um, yeah. So no wild, funky taste. No outside air hitting it. Um, very enjoyable. I wish I had a sample here for you. <laughs> one, one more technical question, then I want to t- toss over to Steve for his questions. But what about yeast nutrients? Yes. <laughs> uh, inside to learn for, like I said, I've been doing this for six years. 2022, January of this year, is the first year I actually ever started using ye- um, yeast nutrients. Um, it's actually doing the day one, two, three, you know, after 24 hours, 48, 72. So now I add the yeast, n- yeast nutrients, but think about it for up to six years. I, n- I, never, I never had to use it. Your turn, Steve. Well, I was just curious about the, um, if you could talk a little bit about the uh, ABV that you get and, ex- and shoot for, and then just the mouthfeel, the general, um, just the overall experience of drinking it. I've never had it. Okay. I am a mead maker, okay. and so have some, ex- not expertise, that's the wrong word. You do. Eh, <laughs> experience. <laughs> um, so I, I, I kind of know where you're headed, but this is a new thing to me, and I'm, I'm just really curious about, about that. Okay, so as far as the mouthfeel, as I said, from the wood and the leaves, you're going to get some, you know, some of the tannins in it. So when you talk about flavor profiling, I'm thinking about the different remarks or feedback I've I received from competitions. Um, in, inside of it, if you go through the different, you know, they, they talk about the different, you know, beginning, middle, end. So therefore, there is the complexity in it. So it doesn't, the way I make it, it's not just one one dimensional. You know, I, I think the tannins is what's adding, you know, when you talk about the puckering feel, it's not definitely not as puckering as a red wine, mm. but it does add, you know, when you're talking about the sharps, you know, mm-hmm. um, so therefore you do have some of the puckering, but not that you're like, oh, this is a strong um, red. Um, and then I would say when you talk about lessons learned and different things like this, um, tartaric acid um, is, is something that um, one of the judges, you know, recommended. I, tr- I tried that. Um, I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> just, just trying to add some balance to it. Yes, yes, and and so that's the thing. So um, one judge was um, was saying that, you know, maybe I need to add some acid to. Um, I mean, I still got second in that, um, and inside that one, that's a drunk monk competition in 2022. And so 2022 is the first year that I've ever added anything different. And um, but as far as, far as the mouthfeel, to, to go back to your question. So, um, 
you know, when they talk about the hints and the taste, and that's why, you know, when I said the vanilla, you know, the guy was like, oh, I, I, I taste the hints of the vanilla um, green tea, I guess because of the leaves, you know, they're saying that they taste the um, green tea, um, but they usually say it has a long finish, you know, so they like that. Um, as far as alcohol content, um, I shoot for actually for 11%, you know, anywhere between 9 to 11, so by taking my gravity readings in the beginning, you know, and right. end. So that's what I shoot for. So they do talk about the warmth of the the warmth of the alcohol feel mm-hmm. um, in it. So I think they like it. <laughs> then do you do you do anything to uh, to preserve the tej afterwards? In other words, adding potassium nitrate. I'm not. I've lost my words. <laughs> potassium added by sulfite and uh, and. Uh, you know the other one. Yeah. Stabilizers. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just go for the small words. I really, I really had an old man moment there. <laughs> yes. Um, so the potassium metabisulfite, sulfate, uh, sulfate yes. Yeah, so I add that. Then I wait 24 hours before I add the sorbate. And so, yes, yeah, so that's actually for um, for for um, long-term aging. Right. That's, what I, that's what I use for stabilizing aging. Yes. Nice. Well, it's a fascinating story. Do you have a name for your your Tej or your company that people can look for? Yes. Um, my wife' first name is Sanait, S-E-N-A-I-T, and her mother calls her Sanu, S-E-N-U. And so I call it Sanu Tej. And um, and actually, the website actually will go live on August 13th because we're, we're going through the process of getting the state approvals, permits. Um, the website is BarkerHoneyWine.com. Well, excellent. Well, the, with the best of luck, and it, 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 it's a pleasure. I love the Isn't conference it? because of chance meetings like this. We just sat over here because there were empty chairs, and, we're and here we are, it. and we <laughs> found a, one of the most fascinating stories of the conference so far. So, thank you for sharing your time and your story. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Julie Hers, executive director of the American Homebrewers Association. Congratulations on your first in-person HomebrewCon. I know. Feels very good. Thank you, James. Yeah, it's so good to be back uh, in touch with people, you know, face to face and talking to. T- Steve and I were were we ju- were just discovering stories. You know, we start a conversation with somebody, and I say, "Wait, wait, wait! Let me turn on the microphone because you know I got to capture this." It's part of the energy that makes HomebrewCon so wonderful every time. Yeah, and that's why I mean, a national gathering should be annual, and this is a beautiful thing to come back since 2019 when we were in Providence, Rhode Island. Now here in Pittsburgh, going strong. The energy for me is homebrewing is got lots of what's hot talks, what is innovation going on. People are beginners in advance, learning from each other, and it's just it's a great gathering. Now it's it's a smaller get it's a more intimate gathering than than we're used to. Uh, you know, people are probably still a little more cautious about, you know, getting out, but uh, you have safety protocols in place. We did the, you know, we did the clear thing. Uh, and so, you know, there's some confidence in that. Uh, so uh, <laughs> we're being, we're being he- either heckled, heckled or praised. Or, yeah. <laughs> you seem very excited about basic brewing, yes. But, uh, but, it's, but it's so good to see people out in person again. It really is. I mean, the country's open for business. Pennsylvania's open for business. The American Homebrewers Association is open for business. Join us. Become a member. And to get traveling again, to have beers in person. You know, I mean, we're going to have club night tomorrow night. Club night's going to be 45-plus clubs that have come from all over the country to impress each other, serve their beers that they proudly homebrewed. Yeah, you, can, you cannot beat in person. It is, it is time. It feels good. Um, many people are cautious about their travel nowadays. I'm just grateful for the ones that have uh, t- you know, taken that trust and, and given us a chance to be their conference. Talk about the educational opportunities, you know, how much... Uh, how many classes, how many people are, are, are talking and, and sharing their, their wisdom? Sure. So for this year, 2022 Homebrew Con, we have 45-plus talks. Um, there was almost 100 applications for those talks. We have a competition subcommittee on the membership level that vets those talks. Um, the talks I attended today, everything from beginning home brewing to what's up with your enzymes to how to become a professional brewer, were as varied as possible with, frankly, world-class speakers. Um, we just did day one main stage with Keith Villa, Dr. Keith Villa and, um, of Syria Beverages. 
and uh, you know the content will continue to unfold for the next two days and then at the end of Saturday's sessions and talks we will then have not only Bill Kovaleski as our closing day three speaker he is the um, co-founder of Victory Brewing Company but then we will do the National um, Homebrew Competition Awards and they will also be streamed via Brewing Network and those awards will give away more than 45 categories of beer that have been judged on site during this conference for three days from 95 judges so we've got a lot going on all at once seminars homebrew expo and social club evening events and then kick it all off and tie it up in a nice little bow at the national homebrew competition awards at the end and what about next year Next year, we just announced minutes ago that we will be in San Diego at the Town and Country, June 22nd to 24th. Can't wait. Very, very excited. Yeah. I, I, Steve, Steve, you can chime in. I think that's one of our, if not our favorite venue, and we've been there twice for the for HomebrewCon, but that is a cool, almost kind of retro, but, but very well, they've re- flexible. They're redoing it. We'll see what you have to say, Steve, but they, they've updated it since we've been there. Well, yeah, it's one of my favorite venues, and when you announced it, I was like, "Woohoo!" I mean, you know, it was like I was actually when you said town and country, I already knew it was in San Diego. Right, saying town and country, but, you get it, yeah. you get it. We're all like, "Yay!" That's where we have the best parties, and it's yes. pool and fun yeah. and sun and that. Yeah. It's like a campus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the and club night was outside, and I think maybe pro night was outside, and I think it was. And the weather's perfect, and and uh, yeah, it's, and and the the area itself is is wonderful as well. Yeah. Absolutely. For so, beer. Yep. So really, you know, moving forward after a few interruptions, um, not having hosted the conference since 2019, and just not just coming here to Pittsburgh to unfold this, but then to be able to say full steam ahead for 2023. Well, congratulations again. It's good to see you in person. It's good to be here in person, and we'll look forward to next time. Thanks for all you both do on Basic Brewing. Been a listener for many, many years. Good brewing to you all at home. And uh, join us at the American Homebrewers Association. We'd love you to be a member. Membership pays for itself. Give you great reasons to brew. World-class beer. Well, thanks again to Julie Hers and everybody else who talked to us on that first day. And by the way, Levon says his Sinu Tej won second place for specialty meads at the homebrew competition. So congratulations and good luck on future professional endeavors. Also, if you want to hear that full episode on Tej, look for the November 12th, 2020 show with Bruce Handley in the archives at basicbrewingradio.com. All 800 previous shows are available for free in the archives or in your podcasting app. And also the video episodes are on the uh, site as well. Even shows that are too old for me to be uh, to, to, to for me to have posted them on YouTube. So check that out at basicbrewingvideo.com. In the meantime, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to James at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. Please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. It's all until next time. Until uh, until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodds. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long.